In this module, we're going to be talking about two different derivative securities, forwards and swaps. Forwards are contracts that allow you to buy a certain commodity or a certain stock at a future specified date, at a future speci at a specified price. And swaps are derivatives that allow you to swap one kind of cash flow for another. In this module, we'll look to see how these are priced, what are their valuation, and what, why and when are these used. So a forward contract gives the buyer the right to purchase a specified amount of a commodity at a specified time, capital T, at a specified price, capital F, which is specified at time t equal to zero. So the story here is, here's time t equal to zero. At that point, you specify a price F. Along comes time t equal to capital T. This is the point at which you're going to purchase at the price F. So essentially, you lock in the price of the commodity or a stock or whatever underlying that you want to purchase at time t equal to zero at the price F. You could have many different examples of forward contracts, forward contract for delivery of a stock, forward contract for sale of gold, forward contract for converting one currency into another, forward contract for buying a T-bill or a T-note in the future. So we want to understand how to price these contracts. What, how does one set the price capital F? So in order to understand that, let's look into how these forwards are valued. What is the relationship of the value of a forward contract to the underlying price? So let ST denote the price of the underlying on which the forward contract is written. It's changing over time, so ST is a function of time, T greater than or equal to zero. Little FT will denote the value at time t of holding a long position in the forward contract with maturity capital T. What do we mean by a long position? It means that it gives you the right to buy. You have the right to buy. You've purchased this underlying forward contract. So what's the value of this contract at time capital T? So remember, here's time t equal to 0 where the contract is written, time capital T when the, mature, the contract matures. At this point, you can purchase the underlying at f. Let ST be the price of the underlying at time capital T. Then the value of holding the contract is simply S cap capital T minus F. You can purchase the underlying at price F, and you can sell it in the spot market at time capital T at the price S capital T. And therefore, the difference between them defines what the value of the contract at capital T is going to be. The forward price F, this is the price at which you can purchase the underlying and it's set at time t equal to zero. The forward price is set in such a way that the value of the contract at time t equal to zero is exactly equal to zero. Both the buyer and the seller value the contract at equal to zero. Once you set this condition, you can now price this F. You can figure out what the forward price is using arbitrage argument. The final answer of this arbitrage argument is going to be that this price F is equal to the price of the underlying at time t equal to 0, S0, divided by the total discount between 0 to capital T. Here's how the arbitrage argument goes. We're going to buy a portfolio. We're going to buy the contract. We're going to short sell the underlying and lend S0 up to capital, time capital T. By here, I short selling, I mean that I, I don't own the underlying right now. I'm going to go to a broker, ask to borrow the underlying, sell it in the market. Then at time capital T, I'll have to buy it back and return it back to the broker. So let's understand what are the cash flows associated with this portfolio. Use arbitrage conditions or no arbitrage conditions to figure out bounds in the price F. And then from there, we can conclude how to compute this price. So what's the cash flow at time T equal to zero? Remember, the forward price F is set in such a way that the value of the contract is zero. So I buy the contract at zero price. That's this first zero that's sitting here. I short sell the underlying, and therefore I receive S0 dollars. I take that S0 dollars and lend it up to time capital T, so money goes away. So that's this minus S0. So the net cash flow at time T equal to zero is going to be zero. I, so this portfolio costs me nothing at time T equal to zero. What's the cash flow at time capital T? The value associated, ST minus F is the total value associated with the contract. This minus ST is coming from the fact that I had short sold the commodity or short sold the underlying. Now I have to purchase it back and return it to the broker. 
This S0 divided by D0t is coming from the fact that I have lent S0 up to time capital T, and therefore, when I get that money back, I will get S0 divided by the discount rate, so I'll get back more than I lent out. The net cash flow at time capital T must be less than equal to zero. I paid nothing for it, and if I were to get a sure profit, that would violate the no arbitrage principle. Therefore, the, by the no arbitrage principle, the cash flow at time capital T must be less than equal to zero. So let's rearrange these terms and see what happens. So this ST gets canceled with minus ST, and you end up getting a bound which says that F must be greater than or equal to S0 divided by D0T. That's what this bound is down here. The other bound, which says that F must be less than or equal to S0 by D0T, can be computed by just reversing the portfolio, selling the contract, buying the underlying, and borrowing S0 up to time capital T. I'll leave that up as an exercise for you to figure out that you ex exactly get the reverse bound. So now we're going to use the pricing formula that we just calculated to compute the price of a particular forward contract. The example that I'm going to consider here is a forward contract on a non-dividend paying stock that matures in six months. The current stock price is $50. So in the formula, this is S0. The six-month interest rate is 4% per annum. Remember, interest rates are always going to be quoted on a per annum basis. So the actual six-month interest rate is 4% divided by 2 equals 2%. Therefore, D0.5 is given by the formula down here. It's 1 divided by 1 plus 0 0.02. When you calculate this out, you get 0.9804. The formula tells me that F must be equal to S0 divided by D0T. I plug in all the numbers. I end up getting that F is 50 divided by 0.9804, which is $51. That's great. The formula tells me it should be $51. Is there an intuitive explanation for why the forward price at time 0 must be greater than the commodity price at time, S, time 0, which is S0? At this point, I would want you to pause the video for a moment and argue to yourself that this is indeed explainable. The exact numbers are not, but the fact should be explainable. So the reason this happens is because of a time value for money. If you bought the underlying at time t equal to zero, you lose the $50 right away. Here, you have the ability to buy it in the future at a price that is specified at time t equal to zero. You have the flexibility of using that money for six months, and that time value for money is incorporated into the price F0, and therefore F0 must be strictly greater than S0. The exact mechanics, you'll have to go into the arbitrage argument to figure out what is the actual number that is going to define the price S0. Now what we want to do is use, now we know how to price capital F, which is the forward price. We know that the value of a forward contract at time capital T is going to be ST minus F. Now what we want to do is figure out what is the value of this contract at some point little t between 0 and capital T. So the, in the limiting conditions, here's time 0, here's time capital T. Here I know that F0 is equal to 0. This is how we set the price capital F. Here we know that FT is equal to ST minus F. Now I'm sitting at some intermediate point t, and I want to find, compute out what the price ft is going to be. And in order to do that, I'm going to look at two different forward contracts. So one forward contract is written here and has an associated price f0. Another forward contract is written at time capital little t and has an associated price f little t. Both of these contracts mature at time capital t. So both, they are written at different times, but they both mature at the same capital T. I'm going to compare the prices of these two contracts to figure out what little ft is going to be. And what's the trick that I'm going to use? As always, a no arbitrage condition. The answer that I'm going to get that ft is equal to f little t minus f0 times the discount over the period little t to capital T. The construction is done as follows. At time t, at this point t, I'm going to go long one unit of a forward contract at price ft. So this, remember, f capital, capital F little t is going to be the forward contract written at time t 
and matures at time capital T. So I can get into this contract without paying anything. And I'm going to short one unit forward contract with price F0. So at this point, I'm going to short a forward contract which was written at time t equal to 0. Therefore, the associated value or the associated price for that particular contract is going to be Ft. So let's see what happens to the cash flows. So at time little t, the cash flow is going to be, to be very exact, 0 plus Ft. So the 0 is coming from the fact that I'm going long one unit of the forward contract with price capital F little t, and I can get into this contract without paying anything. This FT is coming from the fact that I am shorting one unit of the forward contract at the price F0, and therefore I will receive an amount little FT. What happens to the cash flow at time capital T? The cash flow is going to be F0 minus FT. In reality, what is going to happen is that this actually can be written as S capital T minus F little t. This is the cash flow associated with the long contract minus S capital T minus F0. This is the cash flow associated with the contract that I went short. The STs cancel, and eventually you get this, get this value F0 minus FT. Now, this, what is the total cash flow that I'm going to be seeing? The total cash flow that I see is little FT at time T, F0 minus F capital FT at time capital T. This is a deterministic cash flow. And I did not have to pay anything to receive this cash flow. Therefore, its value discounted appropriately must be equal to 0. So I discount Ft by the discount D0t. I discount F0 minus Ft by the discount D0 capital T. Discounted, its value must be equal to 0. This is what the no arbitrage condition would tell me. And therefore, you'll end up getting that little Ft is nothing but F capital T minus F0 times D0 capital T divided by D0 little t, and that can be simplifi simplified to Ft minus F0 times D little t to capital T. That's how we set the values for forward contracts. Next, we want to look at swaps, define what swaps are, and talk about why swaps are important this will also let us uh, get into what, are, what do intermediaries do. And then finally, we're going to price a swap. Swaps are contracts that transform one kind of cash flow into another. The most plain vanilla swap swaps fixed interest rates for floating interest rates. So they take a cash flow on a notional principle. One party receives a fixed interest rate on it and plays a floating interest rate on it. And the other party does the reverse. Commodity swaps, you could have gold swaps. One person gets the floating price of gold, and the other person receives a fixed price uh, over a certain period of time. Similarly for oil swaps, one person receives the floating price of oil and then pays a fixed price over a certain period of time. Currency swaps are the same. Why do people use swaps? People use swaps to change the nature of cash flows. I want to lock in the price of oil for the next 10 years. So I can contract with somebody who pays me the floating price of oil, and, in, and I pay this person a fixed price, which is decided at time t equal to 0. So as far as I'm concerned, I have fixed the price of oil for the next five years, let's say, if the swap is for five years. I, can, I receive the floating price of oil. I can use that to purchase oil in the spot market, and I pay this person a fixed price. So effectively, I'm using a fixed price for oil, and similarly for gold, for currencies, and so on. The other reason why swaps are used is to leverage strengths in different markets. And here's an example for it. There are two companies, A and B. A is a better company than B. In the floating rate market, it can borrow at LIBOR, which is the London interbank offer rate, plus 0.3%. In the fixed rate market, it can borrow at 4%. Company B can borrow in the fixed rate market at 5.2%. And in the, live, in the floating rate market, it borrows at the rate of LIBOR plus 1%. In both markets, company B is worse than company A. But company B is relatively stronger in the floating rate market. The difference between the two rates is 0.7%, whereas in the fixed rate market, it's 1.2%. So what, we can, what A and B can do 
is use the relative strength of B in the floating rate market to create a swap amongst themselves such that both of them are better off. So what's going to happen? Company A is going to borrow at the fixed rate market. Why? Because that's where company A is powerful. The difference is 1.2%. And then swap with B so that effectively it becomes a floating rate bond for A. So here's how the transactions are going to work. Here's company A. It is going to borrow from the fixed rate market, so it's going to pay 4%. Company B, which is stronger in the floating rate market, is going to pay LIBOR plus 1%. And then they're going to go into a swap. Company A is going to pay B LIBOR and receive 3.95%. Now, if you effectively see what happens to A, A pays 4% in the fixed rate market, receives 3.95%, and pays LIBOR to company B. Together, they end up, they, they cancel each other, and effectively, company A is now paying, so there should be a negative sign in front of this, LIBOR plus 0.05%. The best it could have done by itself was LIBOR plus 0.3%, but via the swap, it now pays LIBOR plus 0.05%. What happens to company B? Company B pays LIBOR plus 1%. This is what is going on there. Receives LIBOR from company A, and then pays to company B 3.95%. Netted, you end up seeing that company B actually pays minus 4.95%. By itself, it could have the best it could have done in the fixed rate market was 5.2%. So both of them are better off. Both company A and company B are better off by going into a swap agreement with each other. And they are leveraging the two strengths. A so company B is stronger in the floating rate market, and that's where it borrows. Swaps with A to get a fixed rate um, loan. Company A is stronger in the fixed rate market. Swaps with company B to get a floating rate loan. So how does this 3.95 get set up? That gets set up by the relative strengths of company A and B. But one of the big problems with the swap agreement, the way it is set up right now, is the fact that what if A gets into this agreement with B, starts planning everything, assuming that it's going to be paying a floating rate of LIBOR plus 0.05%, and suddenly company B goes bankrupt. So this payment part just disappears. Company A is willing to pay LIBOR, but company B doesn't exist anymore and doesn't re receive the 3.95%. So suddenly, now company A is not paying a floating rate of LIBOR plus 0.05%, but instead is paying a fixed rate of 4%. And that could wreak havoc to whatever they are trying to do. So they, don't want, they want to be, prevent this counterparty risk. This entire story of another counterparty going bankrupt is called the counterparty risk. It wants to make sure that the counterparty risk does not happen. And this is where financial intermediaries come in. So the financial intermediaries are people who take on risk and then are get paid for it. So instead of A directly talking to B, A will talk to an intermediary. I'm just going to call it financial intermediary FI. And the financial intermediary will go talk to B. So there will be a swap here. There will be a swap there. So even if B disappears, this financial intermediary is going to honor its obligations to A, and A is safe. What Why does the financial intermediary get into this picture? It gets into this picture because for taking on this counterparty risk, it gets paid a certain amount. So in real life, the way the swap would work would be Company A will borrow in the fixed rate market at 4%. It will get into a swap with an intermediary where it pays LIBOR and receives 3.93%. So this is less than the 3.95% that it was receiving before. B will borrow in the floating rate market at LIBOR plus 1%. It will pay 3.95%, which is greater than the 3.97%, sorry, which is greater than the 3.95% that was there before. And it will receive LIBOR. So the financial intermediary makes 0.02% here and 0.02% there, or, a, or four basis points. And why is the intermediary paid this amount? It's paid this amount because it's taking on the counterparty risk. 
In this uh, slide, we're going to work through pricing an interest rate swap. So what's happening here is a company A is going into a swap agreement with company B. Company A is going to pay on some notional amount N a fixed interest rate X, which is going to be determined, and is going to receive from company B N times RT over a certain period, say T going from 1, 2, and capital T. We want to price this swap contract. And again, as with forwards, swap contracts are set up in such a way that the value of the contract is equal to 0. So there are two kinds of cash flows going on. Um, a is playing a, a floating amount to B and receiving, sorry, it's receiving a floating amount from B and paying um, a fixed amount to B. So let's try to price this floating part, which is the tough part. We can float this, we can price this floating part by just recognizing that its cash flow is identical to the cash flow of a floating rate bond, except that in a floating rate bond, you will end up getting a face value N at time capital T. The way the swap is constructed, you do not get the face value. So the price of the floating rate part is going to be the cash flow associated with the floating rate bond minus the face value. So the cash flow associated with the floating rate bond is just N, and this is something that we computed in the interest rate module. The face value has to be discounted back, so it becomes N times a discount over zero to the capital T. So this entire bracket here is actually the value of the floating rate bond. This is what A receives, and it pays a fixed amount. Fixed amount can be discounted very simply. It's going to be N times X, the summation of the discount from little t to capital T, and this shouldn't be capital T, but little t. Now, we need to set the value x in such a way that this value is equal to 0. The value to a is equal to 0. If you set up the equations and solve it, you end up getting that the fixed interest rate x, which defines the swap, is going to be given by this formula.